Well, welcome to the Institute of Managers and Leaders Australia and New Zealand. Thank you so much for joining our third session uh, of today's development day. It's fantastic to have uh, Shannon Cooper, our pinch hitter, always um, rounding out for the, the, um, the third session today. And it's, um, it's great to have Shannon on board. Um, and we're really looking forward to this third session. I think it works in very nicely with what Jackie has done. Um, at the beginning and also feeding off uh, off Grant as well, which were both sensational presentations. And thank you so much for engaging in those presentations and your feedback as well has been phenomenal. And I've got no doubt that Shannon's will be the same. So thank you very much um, for joining us. Um, like I said um, at, in each presentation, you know, the Institute is all about practical outcomes. You know, we want to deliver practical training outcomes uh, for our professional members and also our corporate clients. Um, and we also want to make sure that the learning sticks. Um, and whilst today's hour long uh, webinar with Shannon will give you some fantastic opportunities to learn and to take away in your action plans, um, there's no doubt that further learning um, and continuing that learning journey is also very um, advantageous. And, and we'll go through some of the steps that we can take you on as the Institute um, to take that learning further. Um, but look, in 2022, the workplace looks very different, we know that, than just a few years ago. The pandemic has reshaped really the way uh, we work, what we expect from our employers, and what really matters to us in the working environment. Things have changed, um, and workplaces have to adapt. And that's what Shannon's going to talk about today, is really looking at you know how do we create an attractive, a hybrid workplace that boosts productivity, but also drives employee retention. Um, we know this is the pain point for so many businesses out there. Our professional members tell us this, our corporate clients tell us this every day. How can we, how can we um, drive the productivity and boost that employee engagement in our business and, and, and also support retention? So um, I've got no doubt that today's session is going to be very valuable. A couple of things that I have been remiss um, to mention at the start of the earlier sessions is that all of the resources that Shannon will talk about today will be emailed to you um, at the conclusion of the presentation. So um, please don't quickly have to scribble down and stop listening to Shannon. All the resources will be coming to you at the end. Please, please send questions throughout Shannon's presentation. We will have time for an Ask Shannon session at the end. Um, so hopefully we've got 10, and 15, 10 or 15 minutes to do that. And also all of you have got your action plans there. So like I said, it's the Institute, we want you to get some practical learning from this, some takeaways to implement back into your job, into your workplace, to make your life easier um, and to make your organisation and your people more productive. So please use those action plans throughout as well, um, based on uh, Shannon's discussion today. So um, let me introduce Shannon. Um, most of you will know Shannon, who have um, uh, been in and around the Institute um, over the, the past, um, oh, I don't know what Shannon, four or five years now, um, you've pretty yeah. much um, been uh, been the person that does um, everything for us, essentials, foundations, accelerate, all of our workshops, Shannon's heavily involved with the Institute and everything we do as well as supporting our corporate clients on a daily basis um, to deliver great leadership outcomes for them. So um, Shannon you know, has worked with big and small teams, single and multi-site businesses, helping lead big impact leadership programs. We all know that. Um, his high energy workshops, his presentations always delights the audience, um, while his invigorating training methods help unshackle powerful ideas and foster lasting organisational change. He's achieved success from the boardroom to the shop floor and from the head office to the site shed. I love that comment, Shannon. Um, and uh, we always welcome Shannon Cooper to the Institute of Managers and Leaders. Shannon, you've got the floor. Hey, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope that uh, you've all been enjoying uh, our development day. Uh, we're always uh, very proud and very excited here at the Institute of Managers and Leaders when these days come along and uh, delighted that we can welcome so many of you here today. Um, and uh, I know that you've enjoyed some fantastic sessions with uh, with Jackie and Grant this morning um, and hope you've had a good lunch. Um, and my job over the next uh, hour or so is to make sure that we get over that uh, little afternoon bump that we offer and have after lunch by giving you some really provocative stuff to think about but as Sam said also some hopefully some practical things that uh, that you can do to think about what the future of work 
looks like. Uh, so we've called this Office 2.0 a source of or a new source of competitive advantage. So what are we talking about? What are we going to be doing over the next hour? So let me uh, let me give you a bit of a, an overview on what our agenda looks like. We're going to start off by talking a little bit about where are we, <laughs> um, and I don't mean sort of. You know, sitting here in, uh, in in my studio, wherever you might be, but in, in, from the broad perspective, you know, where are we? You know, 2020 through to March, the, what, I don't even know what the date is, so it was March 8th or 9th <laughs> um, of, uh, of 2022, where are we? What, what's the current uh, landscape look like? Uh, and from there, I want to talk about, well, where are we actually going? And this is a little bit of an opportunity for, uh, I suppose, uh, me and, and us to share a little bit about what we think the, the next 12 months and beyond is going to, to look like. And the third step is all about, well, how do we get there? And you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about here uh, at the Institute of Managers and Leaders through all of our program is this concept of intentional leadership. And rather than just going with the flow, hustling hard, working hard, uh, and trying to, you know, hoping that that leads us somewhere great, how do we intentionally start to think about the future and designing the workplace of the future that again, as Sam said, that is is one that is not only uh, you know, um, uh, consistent with you attaining a competitive advantage, but is also one, and this is linked with competitive advantage, of course, one where the best talent want to come and work, and the best talent want to want to kick around. And really, that's the uh, that's the goal of today's session. But I'm curious to know, uh, as I said, the first question is, where are we? Um, and I'm curious to know, where are you folks all coming from today? Where, where are you? Are you, you, are you in the office? Um, are you at home? Maybe you're somewhere else. Maybe you're on a beach somewhere or at a local cafe or I don't know. Maybe you're, you're, you're sitting out in a hammock somewhere. Where, where are you? What's your current work situation look like? Maybe it looks like a mix of everything for you. You're a little bit here. You're a little bit there. A little bit in the office, a little bit in that cafe. So to get a bit of a sense of where you are all, your current sort of working circumstance, I'd love you to grab your phones um, and take a picture of this QR code. And if you haven't got a device or your phone, uh, Libby is putting a link into the chat box for us and you can click on that link and it's going to take you through to uh, a, a program that some of you will be familiar with called Menti. Menti is a really good tool uh, if you're working um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a hybrid setting uh, and when you take a picture that's going to take you through to an image like that and that will give you an opportunity to put uh, a pin, uh, a life light image. I want you to put a, up on the top left hand side. Maybe you're working from home and thriving, and maybe that's your your new lot in life. Maybe you're down in the bottom left hand corner where you look. You're working okay, working from home and doing okay. Like it's it's. I'm working from home, but can't wait to get back into the office. Maybe top right hand corner. Maybe you're back in the office, but a little bit here and a little bit there, kind of in that sort of hybrid sense. Or maybe bottom right hand side, which is you are back in the office, fully vaxxed, back in the office. Um, and uh, spending your, your full time there. So I want you to just take a little moment to do that. We'll uh, uh, have a bit of a, a sense of where uh, people are coming from today. I'll give you a little bit of a moment to do that and we'll have a look at some results. We'll send you through the results as well. This is always fascinating to see where folks are coming from. I'm just getting the results up here. Beautiful. I think everyone's sorted that out. Thank you for the link there, Libby. <laughs> Beautiful. So a real mix, huh? Um, again, you, 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 we'll, we'll share the results with you. If I get my screen down, it'll, it'll blow us over and go to webinar and I can play a bit funny. But there's a real mix of, uh, of, of folks. But it, it is interesting, isn't it, to think wherever you are working from today, the reality is that you know, in early 2020, almost two years ago now, it's a bit scary to think about, isn't it? Um, the, the working from home. Uh, or working from some place other than the office, but particularly home, became a reality for, for many people, um, literally in a matter of weeks as COVID-19, um, as the COVID-19 pandemic forced all of these stay-at-home orders with all of our governments across Australia and indeed across the world. Um, I remember reading a, um, a Fair Work Commission report and it said that in, I think it was about May 2020, so when you know, just about all of Australia was in lockdown, um, more than a quarter of Australian workers were working from home. You know, roughly about four and a half million people were working from home. Just stop and think about that. A quarter of all Australian workers were working from home. Now, of course, in doing so, when we were working from home, 
a lot of these long-held beliefs that we had about working from home were obliterated, right? Despite all the fears that we often had about working from home, fears about productivity, fears around collaboration, uh, engagement, et cetera, et cetera, well, we worked out that no, <laughs> those fears are unfounded and that we can still get stuff done even though we're working from home. Or another way of thinking about it, we can still get stuff done without the physical office. And of course, what also started to happen was that um, we started to find a meaningful sense of work-life balance working from home. Uh, you know, in amongst all the homeschooling and all the rest of it notwithstanding, we started to realise that this is kind of nice not having to deal with the commuting. Uh, we started to, to, it was nice to, be, to have a bit more family time, to maybe go and walk the dog during your lunch break, engage in some hobbies with that, that additional time, right? So for many people, that, that early period of time throughout 2020 and into 2021, um, it seemed like we had the best of both worlds. Right? And we started to ask some very real questions about whether or not we would need to, and indeed when, uh, we would need to return to the office. Right? So what we started to find was that these traditional beliefs that you can see here on the left-hand side were completely challenged and upended by some of these things on the, on the right-hand side. And this is uh, um, some statistics from a Deloitte report, again, which we've included in the resource pack for you. So these ideas that work has to be done in the office, well, we realise that no, businesses can continue um, even though uh, we're not coming into the office. We thought that people, you know, if you're a lot of leaders, right, people don't work as hard if they're working from home. Well, we know that people are often more productive and indeed work more hours when they are working from home. We thought that employee engagement would suffer. Well, again, we realised that with really great technology, um, uh, greater collaboration and engagement is absolutely possible for many people. Right. We also thought that when it came to recruiting people, that many, it's like, well, we've got to recruit people who are close to our offices, you know, close to our geographic locations, right? Or if we want people to move even interstate or across the city, we're probably going to have to reimburse them for some of those, uh, those relocation costs. But we realised that no, working virtually uh, removes all of those geographic restraints that, and constraints that we often thought were, were clear. And we also thought that look, we could have shared facilities that reduce overhead costs. You know, if we kind of have a location where lots of our people can come to work, that's better than having lots of smaller locations. But of course, what we also realised that the more remote we are, fewer facilities we need, less overheads, and we can drive down our infrastructure costs. So all of these, these, these traditional beliefs and, and myths were busted, if you like, throughout 2020 uh, 20 and 2021. But there's also another reality, which is important to point out. As this continued deep into 2021 and you know, towards uh, 2022, Let's face it, <laughs> we started to get pretty exhausted with it all as well. And we started to feel somewhat disconnected from work. And work at home, even though we initially had that little bounce of, of newfound work-life balance, we started to realise that work was indeed encroaching on our personal lives as well. And more recent conversations have been around burnout um, and, and managing people's well-being and things like this. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that whilst uh, there's a lot of upside to having people work from home, it's not all sunshines, unicorns and rainbows. And I reckon most of us have experienced that either ourselves or friends or even colleagues that we work with have really noticed this, this you know, somewhat desire to get back to work or this, this overwhelming sense of, of, of just exhaustion um, as the, the barriers between home and work kind of become a little bit more diminished. So this is kind of where we're at, right? 2022, here we are where we're now starting to have some real conversations about the return to work, right? The, the vaccination, vastly vaccinated population in Australia, there is serious conversations about, right, let's get you back to work. Right now, of course, as I said, many workers miss that interaction with their colleagues and they're eager to get back to the office, right? But at the same token, many people are reluctant to kind of give up those improvements in their work-life balance. Now, what of course we know is in survey after survey, research after research, um, article after article tells us that what people now want is some form of a flexible working, right? A future where they can work from the office, and also have the flexibility to work remotely in some way, which for most of us, of course, is, is at home, All right? Now, of course, at the moment, many of the conversations that, uh, that we are having is about this, this return to the office. And the conversations that, that I'm observing uh, and the conversations that I'm noticing many leaders and organisations having is around the logistics. What days will people come back to work? 
right? What date will they start coming back to work? How many days will they be in the office? Right? These kind of logistical conversations is what a lot of organisations are having, right? How many days in the office? How many days at home? Uh, who do we have in the office on a given day? And how do we kind of flex our rosters and all this stuff? Now, these are, of course, important logistical issues to solve, right? But here's the thing, right? At the moment, we don't have any data around this, so we're kind of just doing what we think is best. We're thinking, okay, well, what do we think is, is, is best for our people and best for our organisations, right? And that's leading to some of these blanket determinations that, right, we've got a policy, right, where our people will be required to work three days in the office and the other two days they can work flexibly, right? Other organisations, yeah, a bit more laissez-faire, you get to choose, right? We'll just leave it up to you. If you want to come in, you can come in. If you want to work from home, you can come home, right? But I just think that this blanket approach of saying, hey, we want to get people back into the office, and that's often uh, justified by saying, well, we need to get people back into the office for social connection, collaboration and sharing is useful. Um, but I think it's only part of the story here. And what I think is that what we want to try to do is think about the role that the office plays in the future and have a deeper conversation that extends just beyond the logistics of when are we going to come back to work or where are we going to work from and start to think about the alignment of the role that the physical office plays and the way that people work from a strategic perspective. I know this is one of the things that we talk a lot about, particularly in our Accelerate of Intentional Leadership Program, uh, where we challenge leaders to think deeply about their organisational strategy and the role that they can play in informing it. And I think that the return to the office plays a critical role or should be playing a critical role in any strategic conversation that you're having right now. Right. So what we want to try to do is think about, well, where are we going? And it's not just about are we going to work in the office, the home, somewhere else or a mix of anything. Right. Because the reality is that um, <laughs> even if you've got one of these policies about returning to, to the office, people don't want to come back to this. Right. People aren't going to come back to their little cubicles anymore and, and sort of work at their little workstation uh, for, for you know, nine to five. That's just not going to cut the mustard. What we need to think about is our offices probably can't be this anymore. This is a fairly dramatic image, right? But it's probably not going to be this anymore. But what is the role that the office plays in helping us achieve our strategic goals and imperatives? Right? Because if we can talk about that and reflect on that, then we start to get a bigger sense of, well, okay, where, where are our people best equipped to add value? Where are our people best equipped to create that uh, or fulfil that aspiration that we have from a strategic perspective? Um, and where is that work best done? In the office or at home or somewhere else? Right. It's a fascinating question to think about that extends us beyond those logistical questions. Not ignorant to those, they're important things, but there's a deeper conversation that intentional leaders have and need to have right now. So one of the things that we've spoken about previously, and if you've been to some of my sessions, you'll, you'll know this, is that we, um, I talk a lot about this concept of anti-fragility, which is uh, as leaders from our organisations, what's our strategy at the moment? And this is a, a deep concept, but one of the things that I think is, is critical at the moment is that we, we shouldn't be thinking about we should be thinking beyond resiliency, I think, and that's not to diminish resiliency. And I'm not talking about necessarily personal resiliency, but organisational resiliency. And what I mean by this is that we shouldn't you know, be looking at this as an opportunity just to say, well, what do we need to do to ride out the storm to get back to where we were? I reckon what we need to be talking about on a strategic and operational level is how do we become even better than we were before? So if you think about this in terms of, of, of engagement of people and retention of talent, it's like, well, how do we create a more engaging workplace and culture than we've ever had before? How do we increase the stickiness of our organisation? How do we increase the, uh, the desirability of key people to come and and work for us. Rather than just getting back to where we were, let's aim even higher, which is the concept of anti-fragility. Nassim Taleb uh, is the, uh, the author of this concept of anti-fragility. It's provocative in itself, um, but uh, and you can read up a little bit more on that if you so choose, but I reckon that needs to be the, the aspiration of, of, of leaders right now. You know, another way of thinking about this is never waste, uh, you know, never, never waste a crisis. Uh, that's another quote that we often hear about. What can we do to get better? And a key part of that needs to think about what's the role that the office plays. So what is your strategy, right? Think about this. What's your strategy right now? You know, is it about dealing with disruptions, navigating through what's going on and just working out how to get to the other side? Is it kind of just 
trying to deal with all the uncertainty um, and, and again, battening down the hatches and waiting for times to become a little bit more stable. Maybe you're looking at emerging trends and technologies. Maybe you're already having some conversations about the changing needs of your customers. But as I said, I think one of the aspirations should be is to become anti-fragile, to become better. Now, in order to do that, of course, um, if we want to become better than we were before, uh, I use the word better, better, more profitable, um, uh, it might be uh, more innovative, it might be more agile, it might be to increase your uh, your market share. Um, I don't know, lots of different definitions for better, but I think you get the gist right. But of course, in order to do whatever that is that your, your aspiration is, we need our people to come to work and to be highly engaged and to unleash their creative potential, right? That's what we need. Right? Now, of course, creativity thrives when people come together physically, right? We know that. And that's why we still need the office. Even for organisations that want to embrace fully remote working environments, there is still a place for the physical office. There is still a place for the location where people can come to work. Right. The challenge, though, is that, and this is what I think, is that Office 2.0, if you will, that's why I reckon that the physical office takes on a new role in the future of work. Right. Let's face it, before COVID-19, all kinds of stuff was done in the office. You know, the, the, the office <laughs> was just where we came to do stuff. Right. But as I said, I reckon the office needs to be reimagined. It needs to be repurposed. The office needs to become anti-fragile, which is about what Office 2.0 is all about. And I reckon it can become, if we think about it, and I'll share with some ways of doing this, um, it can become almost like a, like a, like a, like a leverage point or an anchor point for, um, for even during times of uncertainty, where when there is chaos and who knows what kind of chaos is going to come our way, having that that kind of hub, a location where our people can come together to tackle these problems is going to be vitally important. Right. But the other key consideration in all of this is rather than just saying, well, the office plays a role, is that. The other, the conversation or the way of unlocking this in terms of what role does the office actually play is to extend our thinking about work in 2022 and beyond. And work, the contemporary worker needs to, and, and the work that they do, I would suggest needs to be considered in a way that is more than just the sum of its parts, you know, where we kind of just do some stuff in the office and we do some stuff remotely. We need to think about the value that those people are adding uh, and where that value links in with what we're trying to achieve strategically uh, and think about where that work is best done as well as managing uh, the expectations of our workers. Right. So there's a fine line here between the office absolutely has a role and, and, and when people come together to solve problems and to connect and collaborate, that's important. But it's also too important to understand where that fits within the broader purpose of the work and the value creation that people do. I think that makes sense. But if that's uh, it's, uh, it's heavy going after lunch, <laughs> but um, if you've got any questions, we can chat with those. So if we think about this for a moment, right, we go right out the role of the office. It's going to take a, a, a different role in 2022 to, to what it did in 2019, right? So here's another question for you, another little menti activity. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What types of work or tasks do you think are best done at the office? You know, what types of things do you think that uh, almost look that that has to happen in the office? That is that that stuff that task, that type of work is best done in the office, not when we've got people working remotely. So same thing again, um, you can either take a uh, picture of the little QR code or you can um, uh, use the link that Libby is uh, sharing for you in the chat box or alternatively in your browser, just go menti.com and there's a code there for you that you can enter. And Libby or Sam, if I could just get you to maybe share some of the insights that people are sharing as they're coming through, uh, that'd be great. I think they're there. We're here, Shannon. <laughs> we're just not sure if oh, we can. Good. We're not just not sure if we can access. Ah, no worries. That's fine. I can. I can. I can get it up here on my little iPad. So that's fine. Let's do Sorry. That. No, that's okay. It's all. It's all this fancy technology, right? It's challenging. It's the technology is challenging us today. <laughs> Even in the chat box. box. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah beautiful. It's starting to get a bit of a sense anyway. I'm getting them up here as well, just as people are sharing. Um, and again, we will share both the results of these Menti canvases with you um, after our session today. So everyone will get a copy as well. 
Beautiful. Cool. Trish has written excellent so I can just... planning, uh, brainstorming, new ideas, discussion yeah. of values and goals. Yeah. Yeah. Starting to see some uh, some results coming through. Beautiful word cloud that we've we've created here. Yeah, a lot of stuff around brainstorming and team meeting, collaboration, planning, networking. Right. Again, um, I can um, see the results coming through. We've got a, a beautiful word cloud, but those key words at the middle that I'm seeing here is is um, all around. Uh, um, you know. Yeah, brainstorming, networking, team building, um, uh, uh, networking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Brainstorming, collaboration, and I reckon this is this is absolutely correct, right? Um, it's not a test, but if it was a test, you'd all pass, right? This means that everyone who's uh, responded has got a fairly good grasp on exactly why people will come to the office, and this is what I think we need to remember: is that the number one reason that people will come into the office is to interact with others. That's the number one reason. Right, human interactions like that, they're the, they're like the, the sort of the ether, <laughs> or the glue that holds our organisations together. It's the stuff that the interactions it helps us be productive. It, it satisfies our interpersonal needs for uh, for connection. You've had some conversations about motivation already this morning, right? Now, of course, this stuff pre-COVID, this stuff was kind of visible. We could see it, right, in our team meetings, our organisational town halls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, structured uh, collaboration. Right? But there was all these other interactions, of course, that we didn't see, you know, and we almost took them for granted, right? Walking over to a colleague and asking for some help or advice, um, you know, running into a, to a colleague as you, you darted down to get your morning tea uh, or your, your morning coffee, you know, bumping into someone uh, in the elevator and having a bit of a conversation with them about something. There was all this stuff that kind of happened. And, and we know that, that interactions, uh, conversations, face-to-face, -face, being in proximity with people satisfies so many things, both organisationally from a cultural perspective but also individually from a motivation and, and engagement perspective right so we need to think about the office as being a place of not where just work happens but where people can interact and collaborate and to share right we need to think about the role that the office plays within that in other words the office isn't just a place and this is where we're going right the office isn't of a future isn't just a place where people go to do work because right? we can do work anywhere Right? I can process my emails, I can perform other routine tasks, you know, I can even get information from, from meetings anywhere, right? Working from home. I don't need to come into the office. But what I will come into the office for is some meaningful human interactions. Right? And even though virtual collaboration is becoming increasingly sophisticated uh, with the technology that we all have available, um, let's face it, video conferencing. Uh, only conveys a limited amount of, 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 of body language, right, and, and energy exchange between people, right? And so there's still, uh, irrespective of the technology we use, there's still uh, opportunities for, for misinterpretation and, and conflict, right? So what we want to do is think about what the role the office plays. Now, what that looks like for each of you is, is, is going to look different, um, but I want to provide you, if this is where we're going, this office of the, you know, how do we get there? So. As you start to think about where work can kind of happen and the role that the office plays, um, I think that what we need to start thinking about is not this binary thought is, you know, is it happening in the office? Is that an office role or is that a, that a, that a remote role? Um, the optimal choice is probably something that's a little bit more fluid and a little bit more dynamic. So one of the ways, of course, that we can think about this is, is what we might call the, the, you know, the hybrid working spectrum. And it is, it's, it's a spectrum, right? It's, it's a continuum where, in this example here on the blue side, the left hand side, we have remote working all the way through to um, on the right hand side where we have the office 2.0, which is where people are coming to work. So I, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about this, this lately and um, I was reading a, a, a research report that was done by Swinburne University recently and they were talking about this, this concept of of where work gets done and, and the hybrid spectrum and um, thinking about that in from a leadership capacity and and yeah one of the the, the the leadership models that many of us are familiar with is something like this the black moot and grid um, and you may have seen this in terms of, of how we can flex our leadership style um, from a task and a relationship orientation um, and again this um, some of you will have seen it, some of you will have not, doesn't really matter, but it's just an interesting way of thinking about leadership and leadership styles and adaptive leadership and flexing your leadership to suit the needs of a particular group or, or context. And I think that we can kind of take the lead from this and think about what remote 
hybrid working might look like and the role that the Office 2.0 plays. So let's I'll share with you what I mean here. So let's have a look at a two by two matrix and on the, um, on the horizontal here, let's talk about task complexity. So the tasks that your people are, are doing within their role, and again, this is gonna look different for, for many different people, right? So on the left-hand side, lower task complexity, on the right-hand side, a higher complexity of, of task. And then on the uh, vertical scale, we can think about the relationship need that people need or the, 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 the level of independence is, I suppose, another way of looking about it. So at the top, we have where there's a higher need for a good relationship with other people in the work that I do. And on the lower side, there's a lower level of, of relationship or collaboration that I might need with someone. So if we take those two dynamics in the Black Moon grid, we, we can kind of start to think about what the future of work looks like, and in particular, the role that the office plays. Now, things aren't always this neat, but let me offer you uh, a bit of a framework to start thinking. So let's think about this. In the bottom left-hand side here, where the tasks aren't in comparative sense or relative sense, overly complicated, and the relationship that I need with other people to complete that task is relatively low as well. So these are probably just you know, routine tasks that people do, individual stuff that I can kind of do, uh, pretty, pretty rudimentary, don't require a lot of effort on my behalf, don't require a lot of input from other people. So these might be, you know, I don't know, some, some meetings, it might be you know, project administrative tasks, et cetera, et cetera, where I'm just sort of coordinating my day-to-day -day work right? Low task complexity, low relationship needs, coordination tasks, let's call them. Then we have concentration tasks. And concentration tasks are the type of task that whilst I don't need the input from a lot of other people necessarily, I do, there is a level of complexity that requires me to concentrate, right? To, and this might be some problem solving, it might be reviewing, making sense of complex information, um, you know, uh, you know uh, solving, uh, de dealing with, with complex processes and stuff like that. So don't need the input from others, but I do have to concentrate to be able to navigate my way through these tasks. Now, by the way, as I'm working my way through this model, I challenge you to start thinking within your role or the people that you lead, what types of tasks are coordination tasks? What types of stuff do they do, the low complexity, low relationship? What types of tasks are a little bit more complex, um, but also they can be done independently, which is what we call concentration tasks? What types of work are your people doing? Where do they add value and where does it fit within this bucket? Then up here in the top uh, right-hand side, in the green here, we have collaborative tasks. So this is where there's a high level of task complexity, but there's also a requirement or a need uh, to work with other people, right? So this is where I need to connect with other people. So this might be team building, starting new projects, prototyping solutions. Uh, it might be, um, uh, you know, again, solving complex problems, having deep strategic conversations, um, dealing with a crisis, for example, uh, workshopping uh, ideas uh, for important clients, et cetera, et cetera. You know, scaling solution problem. Yeah, this is the type of stuff that happens at this level where it's it's complex right there's a lot of nuances a lot of ins and outs and we need people to bounce around with we need other people's perspectives to uh the other people to bring their perspectives to the table and we want to be able to share ours with those those highly collaborative tasks right and then the final little bucket that we have here is what we might call connection and connection is where um where uh, the, the task complexity is relatively low, but the relationship is high. So these are probably meetings, team building type activities, you know, agenda free conversations, social gatherings, um, you know, awards and recognition ceremonies, uh, you know, company events, conferences, stuff like that, that, that um, might include some ideation and creativity activities as well. But it's where, look, what we're doing isn't overly complicated, again, in a relative sense, but we really, it, it's best served um, by having high levels of, of relationship, right? But we need to talk to other people. You can't have a team building session if there's only you, right? <laughs> you, you can't, it's hard to have a team building session if there's only you and one other person, right? To have a, a, a team meeting or, a, or an awards and recognition is literally lots of people, right? It's not that complex for us to do, but it works best when there's more people. So if we take this matrix, right, what we can now start to think about is, well, how does that, that impact with the, uh, the hybrid spectrum? And what we might say is, and this is, this is uh, it, it kind of looks linear, it's not always gonna be linear, and, and what this looks like is gonna be different for, for different folks in different organisations in different industries, but at least it gives us a framework to think about, well, what types of work 
um, or you know, given the purpose of the work, what types of stuff is best done remotely and what types of stuff is, is probably best done in, in Office 2.0. And what we see here is that coordination and concentration tasks could potentially be done mostly by people who aren't co-located, you know, working remotely in some way. Whereas those connection and collaborative activities are probably best done when people can come together, right? Maybe in, in, in Office 2.0. Right. So this gives us a way, you know, of, 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 of this type of analysis, if you like, can at least get that conversation started that extends beyond how many days the people need to come into the office for, to ask ourselves for what purpose are we asking people to come into the office for and how are we designing our office around that, play, that, 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 that purpose and that value add. Right? And if we can buy into this model a little bit, and, and hopefully you'd agree that absolutely those connection and collaborative activities are often better done uh, in the office, then we need to think about designing an office that encourages that stuff. Right? Or another way of thinking about this is not asking people to come into the office or requiring people to come into the office to do concentration tasks or coordination tasks. Right? Stuff that I have to sit in traffic for, sit on, on public transport for an hour and a half each day, sometimes even an hour and a half each trip, to come to work to do something that I could potentially do at home. That's the challenge. And it seems weird, but a lot of leaders aren't having those conversations right now. Yeah. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we get there, right? So this is where we are, 2022, conversations about work. Where are we going? Well, I think we're going to a future of work whereby uh, the office is going to play a very different role, and that is going to be about designing an office that is around um, facilitating deep human interactions. How do, we, how do we get there, right? That's the, the final piece of our agenda. So I think one of the first things that we should start doing is start to have some conversations with your people. Talk to them. Right? Use COVID as a catalyst to talk about what they want from work, what they want from the office, where they think their best work. Now, of course, we can't execute on everyone's needs and desires. That's not what this is about. But we should be having some deep conversations with people rather than just saying, hey, you need to come into the office Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. You can work from home Monday and Tuesday. People want more flexibility. Right? That's what they want. And if we're not engaging in those conversations, one, I reckon we're missing a, um, a, a competitive advantage opportunity, um, but we're also dismissing um, the, the opportunity to retain our best talent. Right? So have a bit of a talk to them. Um, but also make sure that they understand your strategy as well. If you, uh, you know, you, your strategy isn't particularly clear, uh, then it's difficult to kind of align what your people want with strategy. But also too, what we know is that if you can involve people in your strategy and help them understand what your strategic goals are, um, people will be very considerate about their work and understand the value that they can add um, within the context of that strategy as well. In other words, they're likely to be just as empathetic towards you as you are hopefully towards them. Because right? sometimes you go, oh, I couldn't talk to my people. What if I can't do what they say? Well, it's like share with people the purpose of your organisation and I promise you uh, they will think more about their work uh, from that lens and be much more empathetic and willing to compromise uh, and collaborate with you than what you might necessarily think. Right? Um, the other key thing about understanding your people is, is of course, some of the diversity implications as well, uh, which is another big part of this. Um, you know, we've got to make sure that it works fairly for, for both, you know, male and female uh, and different uh, family lives and things like that. So there's there's an undercurrent there of what that looks like, given that there's some new norms around childcare and home situations as well. So you just need to keep that uh, in, in the, the back end of your mind as well. But what we might see if we go back to that hybrid spectrum is that, you know, if we've got a, a team member, like a, you know, I'm just using these as very vanilla terms of course but you know, what we want to do is we might find that a, that a team member someone who thrives on, on that team approach they might spend as the spectrum here says most of their time coming into the office right where they love collaborating with other people um, and uh, where they um, you know where when they're uh, when they're at home what we need to think about is okay when you are working remotely um, how can we still help you collaborate what do those virtual water cooler opportunities look like for the team member who thrives on that collaboration needs to be part of the team but also has a desire to work somewhat flexibly so even though the concentration and coordination activities might happen remotely um, we still want to think about how they can collaborate and share with others in that remote space. So we've got to think about some of those virtual collaborative spaces. So in other words, don't just assume that if you've got someone who really thrives in that, that, that environment, that when they're working from home, they're happy just beavering away on their own. They still need some of those collaborative uh, opportunities. So we need to think about those and not take our foot off the, the pedal there. 
right? You might be a manager, frontline manager of some sort, and you might find that it's almost a neat balance uh, for, for a frontline manager where I'm working sometimes remotely, working sometimes in the office 2.0. And of course, the advantages of, of me working in this environment, um, if I'm a frontline manager, is that I've got a pretty uh, access to a wider talent pool than I ever had before, if I'm prepared to uh, think flexibly. Um, I can invest more time in training and onboarding um, in, in what I'm doing, but I also need to think about how I can manage a virtual team as well. Right, so in other words, it's not just, these aren't just conversations about where, where we're going to work, it's thinking about the implications of that as well. Field-based worker, well the field-based worker probably works mostly remotely, yeah, works out there in the field um, and comes into the office again just for those, uh, those, those highly collaborative um, uh, interpersonal conversations and things like that. Right, so this is interesting, I mean if you're a field-based salesperson for example, this has probably been your life forever, right? You're out there in the field um, uh, doing what you do, hopefully de developing lots of business, uh, selling lots of widgets, and you come into the office for the sales meetings and things like that, right? Now, of course, the opportunity there is that, that if we can consolidate that and uh, systemise that, if you like, uh, then there's a whole stack of benefits that can, can come out of there, and I'll put those in those dot points there for you as well. Right, so just start talking to your people, right? Start talking about what they need, what they want, how does, and, and, and you'll start to get a bit of a, se a good sense of what their individual hybrid spectrum looks like. And as an extension of that, what we want to start to do is start co-designing the workplace, right? So think about it. And, and I'm, I was having this conversation with someone the other day. We might not even call it the office in the future. Maybe office or office 2.0 isn't office or office 2.0, you know? It's, I don't know, maybe it's got some other name. Maybe it's our, our learning centre. Maybe it's our collaboration space. Maybe it's our innovation hub, right? We don't go to the office, we go to the innovation hub. We, we, don't, we, we go to our learning centre. Well, I don't know, it might not even be an office anymore. Right, let's give it, maybe you want to play with some names and stuff like that, right? Names of, of buildings, names of floors, names of locations in the office, I reckon should reflect the intent of what you're trying to do, right? Because if we can do that, and, and language matters, right? Language absolutely matters. If we can do this, then we're, we're sending a, a good signal to our people that this is our intent, this is what we want our physical location, uh, this is the role, sorry, that we want our physical location to play in the future of our organisation. There's all kinds of stuff. I, uh, some, uh, you know, Facebook and Google, you know, they, they, they call them campuses. They don't have an office, they have campuses. I love that type of stuff, right? And of course, the reason they call them campuses is because they want their engineers and stuff to experiment and try stuff, right? like we do on a university campus, for example. Yeah. So start co-designing, talking to people about the type of spaces uh, that they want. Uh, that how they're going to use those office spaces. What will they come into the office for and what's going to be useful for them? Again, I promise you that if you lean into these conversations, you can have some pretty pretty deep ones, some pretty meaningful ones, and you realise that it's not all about ball pits and, and fire poles, <laughs> right, which is often what we think. Um, and again, as I said, make the office a place of, of connection and collaboration. Um, so that might be where we have, you know, locations for uh, um, certain activities, you know, again, collaboration spaces. So I'm not talking about your vanilla meeting rooms, but, but proper collaboration spaces that are co-designed with your people. Um, you might have project kickoff spaces. Um, you might have an office that's flexible enough to allow for social collaboration as well as professional collaboration. Um, there might be, a, a, you know, an intentional kind of rotation of people coming into the office and, and adding value in different ways. Um, might be, uh, you know, cafe type spaces where people can just come and chat to each other, people that aren't even in their teams. So the, the, the central design ethos I think around the office is, is this a space where collaboration and connection can occur? Right? In other words, going back to this idea of the, uh, the spectrum, it's this stuff up the top, the high relationship stuff and how can we create a physical environment where that happens? And just hack it, right? <laughs> so hack it, right? You know, we don't know, like just, just play with it. Um, just, just try different stuff, experiment with stuff. You know, many of us are coming out of COVID and we might not have the, 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 the funds or the desire to have a, a, create a whole new office, but what we can do is, is just try some different stuff, repurpose some of that existing space uh, into, for some different ways. You know, get rid of all the, uh, the cubicle desks and open up that space and see if you can use that for, for, um, for team collaboration, get together social gatherings and stuff like that. Just hack it, just try stuff. It's something that's deep uh, to me. It's like always doing a little experiment, right? Um, and finally, don't be scared. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was gonna say, um, hacking with physical space, here's a few little principles to keep uh, in mind. So yeah, lots of collaboration and connection spaces, less cubicles, lots of flexibility, 
uh, yeah, I think you know, homes these days are often built around flexibility, right? So that we can use our spaces for multiple different purposes. And I think that the Office 2.0 is going to have lots of flexibility. Making sure that the technology is there as well. Technology is very accessible uh, in this space now. You know, gone are the days where um, it was you, you could get away with having some you know, clunky spider phones in the middle of the conference table and expecting everyone to sort of huddle around um, and, uh, and, and be heard. Technology has moved on from that. So I think that there is an investment in, in technology that needs to be made, uh, but that technology is pretty accessible, much more so than it ever has been before. Also wellbeing spaces, a lot of organisations, again, connection and collaboration. So sometimes it's a space where I can just come and talk about stuff. So what does that wellbeing space look like? Right now, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to have you know, yoga rooms, for example, but, but just a space where people can come and chill, right? Even if I'm not in the office today, is there a space where I can just come and connect? That's something else to think about as well. And finally, just experiment uh, with this stuff. You know, experiment and iterate. We don't know um, how this stuff is going to play out. And uh, this is new for us as leaders, as it is new for the people that work in our organisations. So we just need to experiment. And I think everything that I've shared with you today around this idea of the hybrid spectrum, uh, using the, the task relationship grid, and even some of these design principles, these are frameworks, practical frameworks that we can use, but they give us enough flexibility to try some stuff, see what happens, and then move forward from there. Let's keep doing what's working. Let's adjust this a little bit more. We got the spectrum wrong, or we need to up this. We need to, to move this. We need to try this with this team, try that with this team. Let's use this space. Let's try this event. Keep experimenting and iterating. And if you're the organisation that's doing that, irrespective of what your strategy is, right, you will achieve a level of success because it means that you are working hard to keep people or get the best people, be attractive to the best talent out there, retain the best people, and importantly, unlock all of the potential value that that talent has to offer rather than letting it sit withering on the bone. Yeah. Beautiful. So before we open up for some quick uh, Q&As, uh, just to quickly round out this uh, rapid fire final session of our development day, uh, I just want to say that, um, again, I think that, that if we want to have strategic commercial success or some level of, of, uh, of you know, ultimate, uh, achieve our ultimate sort of aspirations for our organisations, um, we need the best people to be able to do it. And what we need to be able to think about is what type of environment can we create where the best people want to come and work for us, they stick around and they give their best selves. And you've heard some stuff from Grant, you've heard some stuff from Jackie this morning about what that looks like on a deeper level. I think what this does is changes or brings um, the future of, of location of work in sync and in step with those conversations that you've had this morning and hopefully challenge you to think beyond just the conversation of a blanket approach where we're saying this is where and when people need to come into the office and thinking a little bit more broadly about what that looks like. Um, make no mistake, folks, the, the time to, to do this is, is now, <laughs> right? People out there want more flexible working arrangements. They want options. They want organisations that are at least having these conversations and have an intent to try to create these types of environments. Um, this is a, a never waste a crisis. I reckon this is a, a, an amazing opportunity for, for, for organisations to think differently about this stuff and therefore unlock a, a high level of, of competitive advantage, almost in a bit of a sustained way if we're prepared to keep iterating around this stuff. So um, yeah, um, Sam, well, let's open up for some, uh, some Q&A, shall we? Thanks. Thank you very much, Shannon. Terrific presentation as always, and some really great ideas and innovative thinking that you always bring to the table. So thank you very much uh, for that. I'm about to get a sledgehammer and go and knock out the cubicles um, here in the office and <laughs> yes. open up the space. Absolutely. Um, but look, no, thank you very much. Uh, it's a terrific presentation. So um, we've got some questions um, that have come through throughout the presentation. So I'll just give everyone a minute to put in some more questions if they like, based off um, what Shannon's talked about. I just wanted to highlight um, that Shannon Cooper will be presenting our high-performing uh, hybrid teams um, on the 1st of April. So a lot of in tune with what we've just talked about that. I hope that's correct, Shannon. Um, I haven't jumped the gun. I think you are presenting um, our workshop coming up. So those workshops are two by 90 minute virtual sessions. So fantastic learning opportunity, no more than 20 people in the cohort 
Um, so you can sort of work almost one on one with Shannon in a way throughout that those workshops to really get a huge amount out of them, um, as well as the other two workshops. So, sorry, Shannon. I just said they should totally come. They should totally come along to that. If you're leading a hybrid team or you want to think differently about what that looks like, absolutely come and join me on the first. And some of the questions actually that were sent throughout the, throughout the presentation actually touch on some of the things you'll be talking about in that workshop, um, which we'll raise in a second. But also, obviously, we've got those other two uh, workshops you can see there in front of you. 24th of March, your leadership vision, define the leader you want to be, um, as well as the 31st of March, the professional communication uh, workshop that um, is there. And also making use of QR codes that Shannon used so effectively in in his presentation, you can simply take a photo of that right there, uh, or sorry, use that as a QR code and, and access it straight away, or email us. You can see those emails down the left-hand side, info of managersandleaders.com.au, or info at managersandleaders.co.nz if you're in New Zealand. So thank you very much, uh, Shannon, um, for joining us. I'll also highlight that I think, uh, if my memory serves me, uh, you're also, you've also got Accelerate, um, yep. as well um, on the 23rd of March here. So Shannon will be uh, facilitating the Accelerate program, um, which is a very much in-depth program uh, over 10 weeks um, and longer if virtual, um, where one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, mentoring, and obviously um, guidance for management professionals is provided through uh, an, extended, um, an extended leadership program. So. Um, Shannon's, Shannon's hosting that as well as we've got Essential starting on the 15th of March for anyone looking for something um, sooner um, and our Essentials program um, is uh, is a four-week program. So, um, so those are all coming up so please get in touch with the team if you are interested. Now let's get on to some questions um, we've got here. Shannon are you still with us? Yeah you bet. Oh your uh, camera's just gone blank. Oh. Oh, no, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We, can hear you. we just can't see oh. you. No worries. That's okay. Maybe I'll stop my screen sharing and see what happens, but I can hear. Okay, right. Let's let's get on to some questions. So how do we convince our directors that this balance is important and that we can't just expect everyone to go back to pre-2020 offices? There are four or five questions in, in this same vein. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and it's probably a question that I've uh, been asked just more than once uh, over the last little while. Uh, and without being wanting to short shrift it, uh, is that I think it's about aligning that desire to, you know, hey, this is how many days people need to come into and shifting it to that conversation around uh, strategic intent. And, and, and with senior leaders and directors, they say, well, let's let's have that strategic conversation. You know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What are our goals? What are our aspirations over you know, whatever the period of time might be, the next 12 months, two years, three years? And let's have a conversation about the purpose of work and, and the value creation that we're looking for our people to, to, uh, to contribute. And let's have the conversation about where that is best done rather than, um, and I think if you've got, again, depending on, on the personalities and, and, and so forth. But when we can have strategically aligned conversations with, with senior leaders, it tends to resonate more than just, you know, hey, this is what I think, this is what you think. Um, and, and I've found that that can be quite a successful approach because it's it's something that, that many leaders haven't necessarily thought of. There's just this, we need to bring people back into the office to collaborate, right? But it's like, yeah, but Let's talk about that in a little bit more depth and a little bit more um, in sync with our strategy. So again, it's a it's a it's a question that uh, requires a little bit more time than that to answer. But in 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 short order, I would suggest make sure that that or challenge those directors or bring to the table that conversation about alignment with strategy and where people can are best suited to, to add that value. Thank you, Shannon. Very well answered as always. We've got a great question from Christina, which actually I wanted to ask as well. Um, but before we do that, I've got a couple of shout outs to Alice Springs Hospital. Welcome Alice Springs Hospital for joining us today and People's Choice Credit Union. Um, People's Choice Credit Union, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, Debbie, um, our Corporate Solutions Manager, sent that through specifically for me to give some shout outs. So um, I hope you've enjoyed um, this third session of Development Day. Um, let's move to Christina's. So how do you see the organic and almost accidental sharing of knowledge 
that is not task-based fitting into this framework. Specifically, we find that juniors learn a lot from seeing senior managers uh, at work, um, overhearing conversations, um, and also using them as role models. Yeah, good one. So hang on, let me just go back to this. So I put that stuff in, oops, here we go. Um, I put that type of stuff in that, that sort of connection space. So that that serendipitous kind of, as I said, knowledge sharing that occurs, that's the connection piece. And that's, again, why we have to intentionally think about this stuff and deliberately think about this stuff. You know, once upon a time, it just happened, right? That Those little casual conversations that helped increase the knowledge and the wisdom in the organisations, they're not happening anymore. So we have to curate them, we have to design them, we have to think about what we're doing to nurture those things. So this is why we have to think about, well, let's we need to bring our people together to have those conversations, that they're not happening in the lift well, in the cafe, in the tea room. Um, and so it's it's that's the that's the approach that I think is knowing. The first step to, to Christina's question is, these things aren't happening accidentally anymore. They're still happening via Teams chats and things like that, of course, but they're not happening as regularly, as frequently and as deeply as they were before. So as leaders, we need to acknowledge that and work out, well, what are we doing to foster environments where those things can still happen? And that's that connection space and the role that the Office 2.0 plays in facilitating those conversations. Fantastic, Shannon. Thank you very much uh, for that question. And to, in the same vein, so what do you do when different people have different interpretations of connecting and collaborating in a, when we're trying to co-design effectively? Yeah, um, had this conversation so, with someone last week yeah, talking particularly around about different extroverts. Teams as well, Shannon, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why I think that you've, you've just got to continue these 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 conversations uh, with people. I know that seems like a just a you know a non non answer to the question, but it's also why I like the ideas of experiments, right? To to say to people, hey, look, you know, I, I get that your preference might be that you don't want to come into the office to do this thing. Um, but what we're going to do over the course of the next, I don't know, three months or six months, let's give it a crack. Let's give it a crack and see what happens. And then at the end of those six months, let's have a look at whether we've been successful or not. Is it working? Is it not working? What do we need to change? Is it working for the team? Is it working for you? So this is why experiments and iteration are important because they can be a way of bringing people on board who might have slightly different opinions uh, to the overwhelming majority or sometimes the opinion or the, the desire of the leader. It's to say, well, let's just give it a crack and see what happens. And I generally find that people will be satisfied with this. And if you acknowledge the fact that you're learning as you go along as well, um, it can, can help bring people along on that journey and overcome some of the resistance that we might encounter. Terrific answer, Shannon. Uh, and thank you very much um, for giving up your time today to present. I think we've got one minute left and we're just about out of time. And I, um, I'm sorry that we haven't got to so many questions here, but there's a lot of people also thanking you as well, Shannon. Um, so, um, and a shout out also from Frank in Auckland, New Zealand, who's just uh, also sent, sent, uh, sent a message through the chat box. So thank you for joining us, Frank, um, in Auckland. Uh, but look, thank you um, to everyone today. Um, it's been three terrific sessions. Um, and uh, I want to thank the three facilitators, uh, Jackie, Grant and Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Pleasure, Sam, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And um, three, three terrific presentations. We've had so much um, positivity um, from these sessions. The feedback's been excellent. If you want to get in touch with the team at all to talk about, you know, joining the Institute as a member, uh, undertaking any uh, professional development, finding a coach, finding a mentor, um, uh, attending some of our networking activities, um, anything um, that you'd like to support yourself as a management professional, please reach out to the team, info at managersandleaders.com.au. Um, we're always here to help you. We've been here for 81 years um, and we love supporting uh, our members um, to create uh, better managers and better leaders for a better society, which is our vision as an institute. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us. I'd like to personally thank um, Joe, Libby, Liana, Paminda, Anna, Maddie, um, and all the team uh, for bringing together such wonderful content, um, our facilitators, um, as well. So thank you very much um, for, for bringing such a great, um, a great showcase um, of our professional development. Um, 
to to both our members, our corporate clients, and and uh, and others joining us today. Um, it's been a terrific um, day of learning, um, and we look forward to seeing everyone very soon. Thank you very much.